Hey friends, it's Avi over here at Musical.Engineering. Things are really crazy out in the world right now, and amongst all this change and all this volatility, I wanted to talk about something that will never change and will be a huge help for you and your music. Intervals. Now, first things first, I want to just apologize in advance. I'm the, the house I'm in right now is right next to a highway, so you're probably going to hear cars zooming back and forth every now and then, so please bear with me on that one. Before we get started, I want to tell you about my free guide, Seven Ways to Write a More Effective Melody. There's some fantastic techniques in there that I use that I use every single time that I sit down to write. They are super awesome. Number five is my personal favorite. There's a link down in the description or just head down to musical.engineering. Now you may have heard about intervals before. In fact, it might be might have been from some condescending prick telling you that you can't write or play music without knowing intervals. And that's, first of all, that's just not true in any way, shape or form. Intervals are just tools, just like anything in music theory that just allow us to use allow us to understand music on a deeper level and that's it these tools are there to help us learn our craft to help us be to help us understand what we're passionate about so let's take away the elitism let's take away the pretension that's not what music is about okay i'm not going to bring that into this at all because it just it uh, you know it uh, it disgusts me truly now the second thing of course you can play and write music without knowing what intervals are i've done it you've done it uh, anybody outside of the Western musical, you know, uh, a zeitgeist has done it. So really, these are just tools that are there to help you understand the music you're writing, because chances are you are writing within that Western musical frame and intervals are a, a very helpful way of understanding it. So what exactly are intervals and why are they the key to understanding music theory the way I said in the title? Intervals are the spaces between the notes. You can think of them almost as a unit of measurement that describe how far apart notes are from each other. We should learn intervals and learn how to identify them, not just for our own benefit, but because it's an incredibly useful way for communicating with the music and also with our fellow musicians. They're what give us the... Car. Game on. They're what give us the nomenclature or the terminology about how to describe what we know will sound good or harmonious and what won't, or, you know, dissonant, consonant and dissonant. Just because something's not consonant doesn't mean it's not gonna sound good, okay? Okay. So how are they the key to music theory, though? Intervals are kind of like that basic concept that we learn that sort of unlocks everything else. We use intervals as a way to describe a lot of different phenomena and a lot of different uh, parts of music theory. So that's why I describe them as this kind of key to it, because once you understand intervals, you can that that's a great jumping off point. That is, in fact, the jumping off point for understanding different types of scales, for different for understanding how certain notes sound together and why they sound that way together and how to describe how they sound that way together. It truly is that jumping off point. Intervals are represented through a series of numbers. Numbers that you might be familiar with if you've ever seen a, you know, a C major scale or something with numbers underneath them. Those numbers are the same numbers that we're going to use to talk about intervals. So this is a C major scale. Let's take a listen quickly just to hear how it sounds. Each note in the scale has a corresponding number. So C would be 1, because that's going to be the root of our scale. That's the, that's the note we're starting on. And as you can see, there's two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now eight here, that's the octave. That's just a C, but higher up in a different register. All of the notes in between, D, E, F, G, A, and B, these are all two, three, four, five, six, and seven, respectively. These are called scaleries, and they're a great way for differentiating and comparing different scales from one another. Now, these numbers aren't the intervals themselves, but they do give us our first look in how the numbers of intervals operate. Now, all of these numbers are referring back to C as 1, as you can see in the diagram. Now, if we moved where 1 is, then these numbers would change, right? So if we moved 1 to D, if now pitch D is now 1, that means E would be 2 and F would be 3, rather than in C, D is 2 and E is 3. 
So C isn't always going to be one or the root. This means that if we want to take a look at these numbers and figure out these measure these intervals outside of a scale, outside of the C scale, all we have to do is move one around and literally count up with our fingers to find out where they are. So for example, A is five or the fifth, we would say, to D. We would literally count D is our one, E, F, G, A. <laughs> And the same thing, let's take A again. A would be our sixth, right? It's the sixth note, the sixth of C. C, D, E, F, G, A. I learned that time. The other time was terrible. <laughs> so this is how the same letter can have, will have different relationships to different starting notes or different notes that we designate as one. This is essentially how intervals work. We designate a pitch as one, so in this case C, and then all the numbers up until the octave are two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now, if you have any questions, you still don't understand this, please leave a question in the comment below. It's, it, it is a little bit hard to grasp the first time, so please just replay this section in the video or leave a comment below. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Now, here's where a lot of people tend to get lost, as if the numbers weren't hard enough. You know how chords have qualities like major or minor? Well, so do intervals. These qualities use the same terminology, and there is a little bit of a connection, but I really wouldn't want you to depend on these in that way, because it will be misleading. Let's take a look at the major and minor scales next to each other. In this case, we're going to use C minor, which is going, which is called the parallel minor to C major because we're using the same root or the same pitch as one. Now, when you compare C major and minor scales, you can see that the numbers are still there. We have one through eight, C to the higher C, and all the no and all the notes in between. However, now we have some flats in front of some of these numbers, particularly flat three, flat six, and flat seven. Now, flats and sharps will raise or lower a pitch depending on which one it is. A flat will lower a note, and a, a, a sharp will raise a note. In this case, we have three differences, right? As I said before, we have the flat three, the flat six, and the flat seven. These three changes are what give the minor scale its characteristic. So when, so as you notice, we're comparing them to the major scale, which has all natural numbers, or in this case, the numbers themselves are just numbers. There's no sharps, so there's no flats in front of them. So this kind of becomes the base from which we will compare other scales to because the major scale is just the numbers. We'll flatten our sharp numbers as we start manipulating these scales more. Remember, these letter names are the same. A three in any C scale is always going to be some type of E. In this case, when we're going from major to minor, it's going, it's an E flat. We're lowering it by a half step rather than an E natural. Let's take a look at a C major chord. We spell a C major chord with C, E, and G. E, as you can see, is the second note in the chord, but this is the third note away from C. It's the third scale degree. Now, the third scale degree of, of, uh, of our one is what gives a chord based off of that note its quality. So in this case, this is, a C, as we said before, this is a C major chord. So that so we would call that relationship between the C and the E, because it's the third and because it gives us the quality, we're going to call that a major third. So even if we're not in the key of C, any C going to any E natural is always going to be a major third because we're thinking of C as the one. The note we start from is always one. Now let's apply this all to the minor scale. You can see that we have an E flat instead of an E natural, right? So when we play our minor scale, we spell that minor chord, that C minor, as C, E flat, and G. So it's not major anymore. And we know for a fact that it's the minor scale, so we're going to take that same quality, we're going to call that a minor third. Seriously, if you have any more questions about this, please just let me know in the comments. This stuff is a little bit heady. With my students, it tends to take at least a couple of lessons, at least a couple of lessons, for them to, to really get a handle on this. It certainly took me a while when I was first learning this stuff, so please ask, ask away, seriously. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So now that we have a basic understanding of how these qualities work, let's 
lay them out, right? So we have our numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So two, three, six, and seven all have major or minor qualities. So minor second, major second, minor third, major third, etc. But fourths and fifths are different. We use the term perfect for them, perfect fourths and perfect fifths. If I'm not mistaken, this has to do with the ratio of the actual harmony itself. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's actually really cool. Go look up harmonic ratios and they'll give you a better understanding of what I'm talking about. It's important to remember that the note we start from is always one, whether or not we're in the key of what that note is. So for example, a D natural and an A natural are always going to be a fifth apart whether or not we're in a key of D or a key of C or whatever, be those two notes will always be a fifth no matter what. Isn't that comforting? It is to me. Things that don't change. What a miracle. This means that major and minor intervals aren't exclusive to major and minor keys. Like we said earlier, the terminology has a superficial connection. Like it, there's, it's, it's there, but it's tenuous and it doesn't necessarily apply all the time. Just because you're in a major key doesn't mean you're only going to have major intervals. And likewise, just because you're in a minor key doesn't mean you're always going to have minor intervals. So remember when we were talking about flats and sharps, how uh, a flat will lower a pitch by a half step and a sharp will raise a pitch by a half step? Well, that's exactly the difference between major and minor intervals. A minor and major interval are, are just a half step apart. Now, we don't call them a flat three or a sharp three because that is that designation, we're referring to the key center itself rather than the distance between two specific notes. That's a really fine line. It's hard to see sometimes. It's hard to understand why it's there, but it just is. Try not to think about it too much. When we say flat three, we're talking about a particular scale or a particular key. When we say a minor third, we're talking about how far two specific notes are apart, regardless of key. This brings up a question. Whole steps and half steps, right? Then we also have minor and major seconds. They are actually the same thing. So remember we were talking about steps. A step are just are another way of distancing notes or, or of counting the distance between notes, but they're not as comprehensive and not as easy and useful as intervals. So in order to kind of bridge the gap between the two, if you look at the second, that's really the key here. The second is the note right next to a note. And a step is always going from one letter name pitch to another letter name pitch. So for example, going from C to D would be a whole step or a major second. Going from C to D flat would be a half step or a minor second. So there's that major, minor, half and whole dichotomy again, right? We have the minor is, the ha is a half step lower than the major interval. So what about fourths and fifths? How does this come into the process? We've been talking about minor and major thirds, but do we have any alterations for fourths and fifths? Yes, but we use different terms to describe them. For a lowered fourth and fifth, we use the term diminished, and for a raised fourth or fifth, we use the term augmented. These terms are also qualities of chords, but they're just not as common that we, we, don't, we just don't really hear them as much in popular music, though they are pretty common in uh, classical music and in jazz. So now that we have a basic understanding of what intervals are, how do we put them into practice? Well, the very first thing you want to do, and this is kind of the biggest deal of all, you want to familiarize yourself with how they sound. This is best done on an instrument that can play chords, or at the very least can do a double stop or a triple stop. So a, a keyboard, a guitar, a violin, a cello, these are really the best, or a harp, these are really the best instruments to really practice this concept on. So first we need to choose a note as one. I recommend choosing C because that's easy. And we're going to go through the intervals. So we would go from C to first, then to D flat, right? That would be our minor second. You wanna play the notes separately and then play the notes together at the same time to hear how they sound together, right? Now C to D flat is gonna sound really dissonant, but this is how we understand how these notes sound together. So that'll be a minor second C to D flat, then do C to D, play them separately, and then play them together. And you'll hear how that's how they sound together. Then go to C to, from C to E flat, and then you'll hear that. That's gonna be the one that's actually sounds pretty good, pretty damn good. Third, and you continue in this fashion all the way up until you get to the octave. Now, if you do this 
for five minutes, say, uh, you know, every time you practice, you're in your, ta- your daily practice routine, you're going to know these intervals inside and out. And not only are you going to know what they sound like, what they sound like apart from each other, what they sound like when played together, you're also going to know how to position them on your instrument of choice. So that's really the big thing. Let's let's review a little bit. We went over the intervals, the numbers themselves, not necessarily where these numbers come from, but how they're connected to other numbers that we use in music, like the scale degrees. We discussed their qualities, which numbers are, which of these intervals are major and minor quality, which are diminished or augmented, which are perfect, right? And the difference between these alterations, minor and major intervals are just a half step apart, and how whole steps and half steps are just another way of describing musical distances. However, again, I really need to caution you about using just whole steps and half steps as a means for describing these intervals because it's just not as comprehensive and it's just not as useful. And when we're talking about our music and when we're educating ourselves, we want to use the most useful information that we can in order to get really get under the skin of our music and really give ourselves a leg up. That's really the big thing here. These are just tools. Some tools are better than others. It's just the way it is. Thank you so much for joining me today. It uh, really is an honor to have you here. I I hope I helped explain intervals a little bit better. And, you know, if not, uh, let me know in the comments if you're more confused, if you just think intervals are useless. Which side of the fence are you on? Let me know in the comments there. Remember to head on down to musical.engineering for my free guide, Seven Ways to Elevate Any Melody. These techniques are super useful, and it's a great way to take a melody you may not be happy with and to raise them up to your standards. That's musical.engineering. There's a link right down in the doobly-doo in the description. Hit that like button, subscribe, you know, hit the bell on the icon to get more streams, more music tutorials and lessons streamed directly to you. So until next time, this is Avi from Musical.Engineering.